This is a Relay Project. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. Well, today's episode of Real Talk, this episode is a trend watch. In just a second, we're going to check in with uh, three professionals whose job it is to know exactly what's going on with business confidence, office space vacancies, uh, different opportunities that people are taking or not taking. We're going to take a look at 2023. What did the business community tell us? What did consumers tell us? What can we expect in 2024? We expect it's going to be informative, interesting, and we're glad you're along with us for this one. This episode of Real Talk is happening with the support of Danatech. You can find them online at danatech.com if you're the one that's in charge of your team's safety training and you're looking for the best in the industry danatech's been alberta's safety training leader for more than 30 years their course is designed by experts with real actual on the job experience so the courses are going to make a difference on your job site not everybody can boast that believe it or not you're going to save lost time injuries you're going to stay some compliant with changing regulations save money on training most importantly with danatech Big companies across Canada are using Danatech's Wemis, TDG Electrical, and Lifting Device courses for good reason. Plus, they've got a catalog of more than 150 courses across all industries. If this is right up your alley, you can get started today by visiting Danatech.com. Check out their courses and find out about bulk discounts. Heather Thompson is the Executive Director at the University of Alberta School of Business Center for Cities and Communities. Corey Wozniak is Managing Director of Avis & Young, one of Canada's leading commercial real estate brokerage firms. And Panita McBrien is the CEO of the Edmonton Downtown Business Association. Heather and Corey joining us live in studio. Punita, I know that was your plan, but you're wrestling with some of the challenges that, well, millions of parents across the country are wrestling with right now. You had a bit of a wrench thrown into your plans this morning. Sure did. <laughs> here Happy you are. to be here virtually. We're grateful that you could shuffle some things around and join us virtually and, and to the two of you in studio as well. A warm welcome. Panita, we, we, we want to kind of kick this off. I guess you might just call it small talk because I think that a lot of people, when you're talking about big trends and you're trying to get a sense of what's going on collectively in a society, you start by asking individuals what their habits have looked like what their last couple of months have looked like and for a lot of people right now it's holiday shopping we're seeing the typical usual important messages out there support local we know that some people are going to the mall like they have for 30 years and and some people don't go to the mall at all anymore for some people it's all amazon all the time how have you been doing it uh, I do a mix of a little bit of everything, but I'm downtown every day, like with the exception of times like right now, um, where I've got my little guy stuck at home who is now checking me with his stethoscope. Who is this? Can um, you, can, who, who is that little man? This is Harrison. Harrison. Good He's morning to Harrison. Well today. He's, He's welcome to doctor. hang out with us on the show if he likes. We're family friendly most times. <laughs> most times. We'll yeah, see. We'll yeah. see how this goes. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, I'm downtown you know, five days a week, uh, most of the time. And so it's actually very convenient to stop and do some local shopping um, at some of our local retailers downtown. We've got some incredible gift shops, artworks. We've got good goods in a temporary location right now, soon to be in a permanent location. Um, and so I've done a ton of my holiday shopping there, which is awesome. Very convenient for the holidays. And uh, then, of course, a lot of stuff online, too. And now I'm going to take a brief reprieve for both. Do what, do what you need to do, Punita, and, and let us know as soon as you're back. But Punita's doing, like, triple duty this I morning with this. us, which is fantastic. Do you remember the BBC thing where the guy was interrupted while he was talking? Do you remember that? Amazing. And, and he was, like, totally thrown off. And then you've got Panita just rolling with it. Rolling with the punches, <laughs> keeping it real. That was that was like the, one of the most watched videos on YouTube. I think the guy. It was. I, I don't remember even what he was talking about. He was like an expert on war or something. I just remember there was, was a big there yeah. was a big world map behind him, and uh, yeah, his kid came in and started dancing around. It was absolutely hilarious. Yeah. Corey, the last time you and I saw each other was just last week uh, at the opening uh, in in Edmonton. People in Western Canada will obviously know the name Henry Singer. It's it's certainly one of. Um, Canada's more reputable, more longstanding. I think they've been in business for like 80 plus years. It's a, a family legacy business, um, basically menswear, but, but, but top shelf menswear, uh, opening a brand new 
location, downtown Edmonton in the Stantec Tower. How cool is it for you, uh, not just as a customer, mm-hmm. uh, uh, but also as somebody who, who, whose business has been built on commercial real estate to see a show of confidence like the Singer family has shown in downtown Edmonton? Yeah, that, precisely. I mean, they've been around for 85 years, and they are certainly a preeminent menswear um, ex- retail experience, but they are showing this bold investment to open their new flagship store in the center of our downtown core in Ice District, and it's so much more than a men's clothing shop. It, they've it's it's created this great experiential um, destination now, and they just opened last week. They they have their cafe wine bar opening up in mid January, and there's all kinds of other you know experiences, luxury experiences that you get from from going to Henry Singer. So it's just a great example of an organ you know a company, a family office that has has looked at where Edmonton can go and where it's been and and sees beyond the noise of the present and is making a generational decision as the third generation Jordan Singer is leading this family company into a new approach of investing in downtown Edmonton with an incredible store a 10,000 square foot um, investment right in the center of our core and is looking at this through the long lens. You have to you have to name drop a little bit for the locals to understand how cool their location is. By the way, we're not being paid to say this, uh, but you and I will both expect healthy discounts next time we go shopping there. Um, but but uh, people who know the, the culinary arts in Edmonton know the name Daniel Costa, of course, so 32 fame, Barbrico and others, Uccellino. So Daniel's opening Bar Henry. Uh, in Henry Singer, which is going to be really neat, great concept. You've got the the team behind Parlor Barba, this really great barber shop that's licensed. They pour old fashions while you get your hair styled, which is amazing. They're in there. You can get your shoes shined uh, while you're getting your hair coming. It's just kind of that more. I like that you talked about it as the shopping experience. Uh, when you're doing your holiday shopping, your Christmas shopping, are, are you the guy that likes being at the like? Do you do you hit the storefronts? Are you a window shopping guy? Are you a mall guy? Are you an Amazon? guy how have you been doing it i prefer to avoid interior malls i i actually uh, shop in store a lot for myself when i'm looking to to uh to buy for me but when i buy for others i often lean to online yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna circle back on your uh entrepreneur seeing beyond the noise of the present i liked how you said that we'll get back to that heather you uh obviously are are someone that's like you you've you've basically had a really good sense of where retail's at we've we've welcomed you to the show before and you've helped our audience understand retail trends what about you personally what does your holiday shopping routine look like do you spread it out Yes, I think most years I'm usually pretty good about doing it well in advance, but recently I've actually just did it all in the last 48 hours. So by virtue of that, I haven't had the opportunity to do any online shopping. So it had to be all in person. And thank goodness that uh, our city has a lot of different options because when you have um, kids, this is such a rookie mistake, but typically I'll let my kids write their Christmas letters to Santa after I have the the, the thing that they're asking for, but this year I let them write it before. So there was some serious pressure to go out and get those things <laughs> that they asked for. Make sure the elves knew exactly what Rookie they needed mistake. to make. Yeah, 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 yeah that's yeah. right. So uh, yeah, no, so it was. It's been it's been really good. But usually it's a bit of a mix. But this year totally in person. This has nothing to do with trends or commercial real estate, Panita, or confidence in the downtown. But I just got to say, I got to get this off my chest. I'm not going to do it on the flamethrower presented by the DQs of Northwest Edmonton Sherwood Park on on Thursday of this week. It's not that heavy of a gripe. But I think, and, I, and I'm not calling for more packaging in an age where we're trying to lessen our environmental footprint. But I have done a significant amount of shopping online this year, and I've been busted several times uh, by companies that are shipping the products in the boxes. Yeah. And, and so they're arriving on the front door, and everybody knows what they're getting from me for Christmas. Punita, can you feel my pain? You look like you can. Yeah, I totally feel your pain. Most of them now will have a little disclaimer. Uh, some of them will say, this package comes in its product packaging. Uh, Um, And sometimes you can check a little box that says this is a gift so that they modify the packaging. So watch for that on the checkout page. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So so Corey says something um, that would echo my sentiment um, that you sort of, what did you call them? Interior face, what did you call the malls? Interior shopping centers. Interior shopping centers. Like you're not like one to like go to like West Edmonton Mall with 155,000 other people on a Saturday afternoon and try to navigate it. Um, I'm the same way, Panita. So for someone in your position as CEO of the Edmonton Downtown Business Association, how much of your job is is working? With, I mean, like for people that don't know Edmonton and maybe every city has these challenges. 
there's about a two square block entity downtown uh, called the City Center Mall. Right now, people are trying to figure out, and I and I may, and Corey, I'd love your insight on this too. What the hell they're going to do with that? Because it's an enormous structure, but but it seems like people's habits, inclinations, trends are changing a little bit. Do you need to work to change public attitude to get people back into malls, or do you need to work with property owners to help them understand what people are looking for? Yeah, that's a, I mean, it's a delicate question for me to answer because obviously City Center Mall is a big part of our downtown, but I think we've seen even pre-COVID leading up to, you know, 2019, 2020, how much behaviors and shopping patterns and all those things had changed. Um, and that, you know, this, this gigantic shopping center in the middle of our downtown that was really built for an office population um, simply could not meet the convenience uh, expectations of mall shoppers. Like people who like to shop in malls, in interior malls, tend to go to West Edmonton Mall or Southgate, like these these other shopping centers that are built for driving to, that are surrounded by these massive parking lots on all sides that are just the ultimate in convenience and taking up a whole ton of land and are just designed for people to comfortably drive to and park and go do their shopping. Um, a downtown shopping center is never going to be that. I think we could sustain a shopping center about a third the size of what Edmonton City Center Mall is. And even actually, if you walk through right now, so there's a, a section on the east side where there's the one beautiful two-story sh uh, Shepherd's Drug Mart store that's got a new exterior. Um, and the food court's there, also beautiful on the third floor. And it's busy. And it's, you know, most of the retail spaces there are actually leased up. There's very little vacancy right now, especially for the holiday season. And you start to feel like, okay, this is a shopping center that can sustain itself on people who are in the office three, four days a week, you know, downtown residents. This is a size that's manageable and it's obviously meeting the needs of, of people in the area, especially like 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. It's packed and then that's it. And it kind of empties out again. So what we have right now, you know, the rest of this massive vacancy absolutely has to be totally reimagined. What are those spaces for? Is it recreation? Is it healthcare? Is it, you know, just building a residential tower on one of those podiums, which is um, one of the plans that's been sort of floating around for a long time. And I'm sure Corey knows a lot more about that than I do. But um, there's a lot of questions there. Meanwhile, street front retail and independent retail and these really unique retail experiences are thriving. Like we have businesses like Artworks, like I mentioned, Good Goods, who's moving into a brand new location, Shop Chop, which is a hair salon in the back and a gift shop in the front. They're all absolutely slammed. They're so busy um, because they're providing something unique and distinct and tailored to a downtown audience and not focused on convenience. And that's what people are really hungry for, especially in a downtown. So totally rethinking what actually downtown retail is and looks for and who it's for and what works. Um, and Henry Singer is a great example. The Helm, who also made a big bet just, you know, right in the middle of coming out of COVID, also a great example of the type of retail that is thriving and what we need more of. Yeah, another beautiful menswear shop. Just <clears throat> there's there's kind of like a district it seems almost happening. There's only a couple blocks between the Helm and Henry Singer. Um, it'd be interesting to see more of that pop up. This is this is all like. Uh, are you working on the city center mall file? I should have even. I don't even know if that's we, your. We work with that client very very closely, and you know a lot of people like to put things in camps of a winner and a loser, and we can have both shopping experiences succeed, and they can both be winners. So the interior shopping mall experience in Empton thrives. We have those that that absolutely um, seek interior shopping mall experiences and others that avoid it and so for for every person that would like to avoid shopping in west edmonton mall th there's others that that thrive in there people fly across the country to get there for sure yeah. so you can have both street front retail uh perform very well as well as our interior malls interior malls in edmonton we actually have a couple that are that are some of the most noteworthy in canada so southgate and West Hampton Mall, uh, you know, West Hampton Mall just, you know, has, you know, the largest Nike store in Canada. Uh, the Lululemon there is the most successful in Canada. There are, there's a, there's a stretch of West Hampton Mall that has some of the highest end retail stores, you know, in, in industry. And so the shopping mall experience is, is so personal and it, it, one doesn't have to be compromised for the success of the other.
How much has this changed over the past couple of years, Heather? Like, people should uh, take note. I was I was talking to a, a restaurateur yesterday, asking him what his next play is because he, from from my estimation, he seemed like he'd been a little quiet. He was expanding and opening a bunch of new locations, and then he just kind of has been holding steady for the past few years. He says that a lot of people in his industry, in the restaurant industry, are waiting until January 18th and then the weeks to follow because January 18th is when that 40 grand Mm -hmm. comes due for so many businesses. You know, more than 600,000 businesses across the country took that CEBA, that Canada Emergency Business Association, or uh, pardon me, assistance loan. Um, And he said that, you know, he's he's concerned, obviously, for his his fellow restaurateurs, Mm -hmm. but also could potentially see some opportunity um, expecting a lot of closures, a lot of vacancies and solvencies after the 18th yeah. of January. Well, it's, it's, it, I found that January was an interesting time for them to, to, to set that date because January typically in the retail world is a hard month because you have January and you have February, which is coming off the heels of a very busy holiday season. So maybe potentially they'll have the, all the sales and they'll be able to pay it back. Um, but I, I foresee that this is going to hit a lot of businesses really hard. Um, I'd be, I'd be curious to know, I don't know if this data exists, how uh, businesses are feeling in, in terms of confidence about being able to pay that back. Or is it going to sink them completely and we're going to have a, a whole lot more vacancy? Um, because ultimately that, that, that loan was so needed at a time where we just didn't have the foot traffic. And yes, we're out of COVID and we've kind of rebounded, but not enough for a lot of businesses where they've had the time to actually go out and, and make that money. And the consumer has changed so much. So it's not only that we had the pandemic, we had really short uh, supply chains. If you remember in Christmas of 2021, there wasn't enough Christmas product even to even stock the shelves. And then there was labor supply. Now there's inflation. So there's, it seems like there's always been something that has been taking place that's been really uh, hard for small businesses to, to keep up with. So... Yeah, I predict uh, January and February we're going to see a lot of businesses, unfortunately, not uh, not be able to survive that. Is that something that's been on your radar, Corey? You know, I mean, in the mm-hmm. commercial real estate space, I would imagine that's pretty relevant. For sure. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, you you see those that are backs against the wall make it through the Christmas season, and then they throw the towel in in January. So, and that's not unusual for 2024. It won't it won't be a surprise. It happens every year. Um, there's there's just um, you know, there's there's certain industries that are um, adapting well and, and, and thriving, and, and then uh, even through hospitality. I mean, now there was there was a lot of concerns a couple of years ago around an ability for a lot of restaurant businesses to be able to to uh, adjust to the amount of of um, uh, curbside pickup business, and, mm-hmm. and you know how you had to adjust to accommodate that. And and now, I mean, there's there's um, there's incredible revenue potential through that adaptation of curbside pickup and uh, in restaurant dining is is um, is really busy, and you you get those that are um, uh, even we see it downtown Ryan with with the, there's a handful of restaurants that are achieving record revenue, and others that are 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 fighting really hard to to keep their doors open, and you don't think that their offering is all that much different, but there is there is something about being in a very vibrant busy place that um, really invites more people to 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 be a part of that experience. And even if the menus and pricing are similar at two different places across the street from one another, there is a gravitational pull to those places that are that are thriving in full, while the other one across the street struggles. And you wonder why that is, but there is just a human behavior of wanting to be in really busy places, and that is why it's so important for us to find more ways to create vibrancy. And it's a big theme in major downtown centers across North America. I know that we're talking Panita's language on that. I can tell you're nodding your head. Yeah, absolutely. It's fascinating to see how busy, just like Corey said, how um, absolutely thriving some of our businesses are downtown. And it really is counter to a lot of the narrative that's out there. There's a lot of this narrative that, you know, downtowns are dead and, you know, nobody goes downtown anymore. And that's simply not reality. Like we have bars and restaurants and retailers that are doing incredibly, incredibly well that, you know, have long since paid off their, their CBA loans. And then we have others that just like you said, Ryan, um, really don't know if they're going to make it and still, and, and I've, we've often said, we don't know when the other shoe is going to drop, uh, in the aftermath of COVID. And, and I was just in Ottawa advocating for some of these things with my colleagues from across the country. So the international downtown association, we all got together, you know, downtown Winnipeg, downtown, uh, Victoria, 
a whole bunch of downtowns and main streets from across Ontario, uh, downtown Regina. And we all flew to Ottawa to talk to the government about where we're at and where small businesses are at. And, and the Federation for Independent Business has been advocating for this too. And it was really disheartening to, to hear that, you know, we're probably not going to see any further extension for these mm-hmm. businesses to get some of that loan forgiveness. And it's scary. It's like, it's, you know, two, two years or however you want to count it post COVID. Um, and we're still in a situation where we might be losing businesses because things have just yeah. changed so much. And certain pockets of downtown are just a bit too quiet. You know, certain business models just aren't really working anymore. Um, and meanwhile, we've got, you know, other areas of downtown, like 104th Street, like Rice Howard Way, that are just absolutely thriving and where everyone wants to be and are so busy, uh, especially this time of year. And so I just I wish we could sustain that all year ro- long. I wish we could have that vibrancy across the entire core. Um, but right now we're trying to also just focus on how exciting it is to see the vibrancy that we have in these little pockets. Yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting to see what the feds do. Like pe- people are still, I think, kind of waiting to see what's going to happen. Like, I mean, it was a month. The one month mark was yesterday. Uh, if you're listening to this on the 19th of December when we're recording it. So, you know, the 18th of January, here it comes <clears throat> for businesses that say that they just simply can't pay it mm-hmm. back. Um, it's a tough look for the feds to, I mean, I'll use some loaded language here, but for the feds to force a business into insolvency, right? The tax man comes calling. Uh, number two, uh, to forgive the loan, because then what do you do for the businesses that paid it back, right? Or number three, to offer refinancing options when the cost of borrowing's up probably four or five points uh, since that loan was first issued. So, mm-hmm. the, But the numbers are staggering. $50 billion is the value of that program. So you understand probably why the feds... And it was rolled out, um, I don't know if I would say hastily, but it was rolled out quickly, right? Yeah. And so now you, I mean, it's, it's a strange situation. Um, Corey, you, t- you talked about, uh, you know, um, uh, be going beyond the noise of the present. And, and Punita touches on that with, with some of the talk around downtowns. I mean, Edmonton's downtown has certainly taken some punches, but it's far from alone um, across the country and around the world. I want to go there in just a second. It, it, it's a trend watch episode of Real Talk as we hang out with Punita McBrien, Corey Wozniak, and Heather Thompson. This episode is happening with the support of sponsors like our friends at Nate's, who right now know that... As 2024 gets started, a lot of you, especially the younger members of our audience, are going to start thinking about your next step. You've got dreams to build the next innovative product. You want to solve important challenges. You'd like to reimagine the future. Maybe you're already doing it. If you'd like to lead change, grow community, or transform business, then Nate's J.R. Shaw School of Business is your answer. It's one of Canada's leading polytechnic business schools. They want to help you harness your inner talent build your skills and feed your curiosity you can learn more by checking out their website at nate.ca slash business that's the nate jr shaw school of business our friends at grand dog essentials quality raw food have a message for all you cat lovers out there that's right of course everybody knows that grand dog essentials has been delivering to Albertans' doors, the best raw dog food in the province. But what about cats? You know, it can be hard to tell about the difference between cat food and dog food when you're looking at a kibble bag because they can have similar ingredients, right? But here's the deal. Cats need meat. Your cat needs meat. They don't need plant food. They don't need carbs. But kibble is full of that stuff. Switching your cat to a raw diet gives your beautiful kitty, exactly what they were designed to eat, and they're going to reap benefits like proper digestive function, effective nutrition absorption, and consistent energy levels. You can learn more about how to transition your cat to a raw, fresh food diet by checking out the blog post, How to Build a Raw Diet for Cats, at granddog.ca. Don't forget your first-time order. The promo code REALTALK will take 10% off it, like we said, delivered right to your door in Calgary, Edmonton, and Central Alberta. This beautiful studio of ours was built by the team at Complete Care Restoration, and that's why we have the confidence every single time we talk about them to recommend them with two thumbs up. We know that this episode is going to be catching the attention of investors, business owners, folks that might own properties in city centers across the country right now, and maybe you're starting to look at reimagining that use. If you're looking at converting office space into residential or vice versa, Complete Care Restoration would love to talk to you. They've got a talented and certified team that does exactly that. You can find them online at completecarerestoration.ca. 
And a big shout out to those of you that are going to be hosting family over the holiday season. May I make a humble suggestion? If you've not yet picked up the turkey, if you don't yet have the menu plan, save yourself the time and the stress and go straight to cateringbyfreezen.com. That's where you'll find the Friesen Brothers Ukrainian-inspired Christmas dinner box prepared by their team of Red Seal chefs ready for pickup at any of the Friesen Brothers locations across the province. You pop it in the oven, you warm it up, and dinner is ready. In the meantime, you're enjoying quality time with your loved ones, your family and friends. There's all the staples in there that you'd expect, the turkey and the, you know, the pierogies and the fabulous sides, including those creamy dill carrots. Plus, you can add on whatever else you like. Each dinner box serves four, so if you have 40 people coming, you just pick up 10 of them. It's nice and simple. Again, that's at cateringbyfreezen.com. We're hanging out with Heather Thompson, Panita McBrien, and Corey Wozniak. Uh, Corey, you talked about businesses that will look beyond the noise of the present. You talked about a generational investment by a family-owned business like Henry Singer, and there's many of them across the country that are doing this. What's, what is the noise of the present? What has it been in 2023? You know, I think there's, there's a, a very deserved impatience that we see with the amount of disorder at street level. And this is happening in every major city around North America. And so there's only comfort in the misery loves company perspective, but we, we have a challenge and, and you know, there, there needs to be a more significant movement um, to work through that for people to feel satisfied that there's a positive path forward. But there is a path forward that is that is evolving that that is just it's much slower to see. And so, you know, community building it takes years to affect positive change i mean it was 10 years ago that the arena was approved it's hard to believe that's already been a decade but that that's you see the impact of what ice district has has now contributed and even through the last you know we're coming up to four years since covid began i mean can you believe it's been it's wild it's wild and so you know we we you know you get on the flip side of a pandemic and all of a sudden you begin to see things very differently and lifestyles have changed and we see more disorder and and what, what feels like a lot of work that we need to do to clean up our downtown. The thing is, this movie's played before. We, we actually had very similar conditions in the late 90s, and we got through that. And so we had this similar, same vacancy rate in the mid-90s as we have today. We had um, you know, some, some very harsh criticisms of how Edmontonians felt about their downtown in, in the mid-90s. And we were able to get through that, and it was largely through uh, creating vibrancy through residential strategy. So. We have this incredible opportunity. We have, we have some very, very effective business attraction groups in Edmonton, right? And in Alberta, you know, you see some headlines. The media gets really excited about the success from business attraction groups when they can bring a company who will bring 100 people, 200 people into, into their markets and boost their economies and maybe boost the downtown neighborhood with that growth of employment. What we have here in front of us in Edmonton is we have our post-secondaries who are announcing plans to increase their student population by 15,000 people. You know, Norquest and McEwen, 15,000 people over the next seven years. And we are not fully embracing what this can mean for boosting our downtown vibrancy. A young adult strategy is an incredible opportunity for us. And when we think about how any decision you make today, you likely won't see the positive impact of that for three years. The, the post-secondaries, including Nate, Nate, their students, they are a big part of our downtown fabric. They um, are growing. U of A is growing. Norquest, McEwen, you know, McEwen's going to go from 18,000 students to 30,000 students. And we talk about students, but we also need to remember that there's, there's staff that need to support that student growth. Most people want to live in a short commute from campus, and 32% of McEwen's students right now rent their residence. So if you just start to do the math, if that kind of growth is going to be seen from post-secondary and, and led by McEwen, and 32% of that growth are going to be looking for a residence that is close to campus, that opportunity for 5,000 students who will be looking to perhaps rent a property that is, that is close to where they go to school or where they work, that opportunity for us to be able to affect a positive change um, with this young adult strategy, getting young people to rent an apartment, buy a condo, get educated, socialize, get their, their, their next job after graduation, 
become part of the downtown fabric, that bodes an opportunity for a great successful formula going forward. So you've got this kind of youth wave like Corey's describing. How important are, are I don't like the word order, but I'll use it back to work orders, back to work mandates, Heather. How, how important is it for, for businesses? Is that even realistic? I, I, I think that there are probably some businesses, maybe even real big ones, that will never get back to what they once were, which is Monday to Friday in yeah. the office, everybody there. Well, it's tough to, to solve an economic problem by mandating behavior. Um, and I think forcing people to go back to work without a really solid reason as to why is, is not a solution. I think it's maybe in some ways it, it might be a good incentive for workers to see the value of coming back downtown. And there are studies, so much data that showcases us being back in an office where we're seeing people, there's so much benefit to that. Um, and I think, I think if we approach the conversation correctly around really inspiring people to come back downtown or to their place of work to see their, their colleagues and their friends, I think that's the right way to look at it. We also want to make sure that we're not building an economy that is based on a lunch hour and a coffee hour. We don't want an economy like that. And so when we're talking about general vibrancy, whether it's in a downtown core or really anywhere, the best place to start is residential, 100%. That's what all the data shows us. That's best is to bring in more people to live down there. That's a huge link to vibrancy and safety. Um, and then the next, uh, and then kind of all following suit is the right incentives, the right environment, um, and beautification. These are some of those really critical initiatives that need to happen for vibrancy to take place. And so if those things are happening and you have this beautiful space where you want to spend time in great restaurants, great coffee and great shopping. And, and then all of a sudden it's not, oh, I have to go back to work. It's, oh, I actually would choose to go back to work because I like the environment. And I do think that's where we're heading. And I do think that's the good news about this as, as, as we see in the data that retail is actually growing. Um, and that uh, downtown cores are having more population go back into them. And so I think right now we're heading on the, the heels of some pretty bad news, um, but I think the future actually looks looks really good and I think we're heading in the right direction. What's funflation? <laughs> funflation, I love this term. So when we're talking about overall consumer trends this year, so we have inflation, record inflation, so it's really high right now, but what we're seeing is consumers are actually not um, scaling back on things that are fun. They're choosing to forego things like essential groceries, Saving. savings, <laughs> <laughs> dentist. I don't know. I don't know why I'm laughing. It's not funny. <laughs> it's not funny. But, it, but so if you look at concert tickets are a funny one, right? Because like, of course, concert tickets were going to be high. Um, but I think concert tickets rose this year upwards of 400 percent. And yeah, you have Beyonce and you have Taylor Swift. But Bruce Springsteen. Uh, Jeez. Sorry, I should have led with that. Of course. Yeah. Bruce Springsteen. So you have all these um, these different artists that are just they're they're making so much um, headway in that people are just wanting to go out and experience things. And yes, that's, that's post pandemic for sure. But it, with this thing that economists are calling, it's calling funflation because as we are hitting financial, financially tricky times, people are wanting to spend their money on something that gives them joy. And a holiday is no difference. And we're actually seeing about a 13% increase in holiday spending this year. And so people- 13% increase. 13% increase, yeah. So retail's growing, consumers are shopping, and we're spending money on things that are fun and we're foregoing other essential items because we feel like we deserve it after the last four years. And that's the psychology around this thing called inflation. Isn't that interesting that like higher borrowing rates, which is directly for a lot, for most people, it means their credit card rate is going to be higher yeah. or their line of credit is going to be higher. Um, it, it doesn't impact people in a certain way. The human brain works in mysterious ways, doesn't it? That's right. And they, so then they say, well, January and February might be a harder crash. It's always a crash, but it might be a, a harder one this year because of all of those things that might come together and might make consumers a bit nervous. Punita, how do you like, as the CEO of the Edmonton Downtown Business Association, we're talking about like vibrancy. Corey talks about a young adult strategy. How, how differently do you need to build a downtown now than, than even like, I'm not going to say 20 years ago, I'd say five years ago. How do you need to build it differently now? I love this conversation so much. Totally agree with everything that these two are saying, which is no surprise because we talk about this stuff all the time. Um, but two things I want to say to that. One is, I think one of the biggest mistakes we can make right now would be to make decisions from a place of nostalgia. Mm -hmm. and, and when I first started in this job, I found that a lot. I would get calls from, you know, lawyers who have had offices downtown for 30 plus years. 
um, who call and just lament about, oh, downtown used to be this and downtown used to be that. And it's never been the same since we lost Fult Renfrew and um, this nostalgia for what, what it once was. And I think that would just be such a mistake to focus on that. I think there is so much potential. Everything that Corey said about post-secondaries, young people. I spend a lot of time with students at the U of A School of Business. They are so interested in downtown right now. There's, there's been some case studies that they've done and hearing their ideas and their preferences for what they want to see downtown and what would draw them here is so inspiring to me because so much of it is the stuff that we are doing and investments that are being made. The types of businesses that are here are really interesting local businesses. Like, you know, downtown has this idea, I think, in people's minds still of being, the you know, big corporate businesses. And that's not who we are at all. Sure, in the office towers, yes, that's who's, you know, walking around and, and shopping. But the, the street level retail, we're over 80% independent and local. And they're really remarkable food and dining, hospitality experiences, retail experiences. That's what young people are excited about. Um, you know, the types of apartment buildings that are getting built. I also hear a lot of like, Oh, you know, these tiny shoebox apartments and that kind of grumbling. That's what young people are looking for is smaller units, affordable units. They don't spend all their time in their apartment. They spend their time out in their community and on campus and at their jo uh, you know, job on the weekends. And so we have to think about what the future looks like for downtown and make decisions from that place. And I think that's a lot of what's happening right now, which does get some Edmontonians. I'm sure this is true in cities across the country. It makes them grumpy. It makes them nervous. They don't get it. They don't see themselves in it. But the reality is that if you're not, you know, 18 to 35, um, you're probably not who investments are being made for anymore. And I think that's the right thing to do is to make investments and decisions based on the future. Um, and the other thing I w wish people understood more is that you have to vote with your dollars and your behaviors for the type of city and community that you want to live in. So it's often the same people who are, are calling and emailing and, you know, writing op-eds in the Edmonton Journal about, you know, I wish downtown was this and I wish downtown was that. Meanwhile, they're doing all their Christmas shopping on Amazon. And so if you're not voting with your feet and with your wallet and going in and spending time in these places, you know, as much work as we have to do, if you're not here, these businesses aren't going to make it and we certainly can't attract new businesses and new residents and new office tenants uh, if that vibrancy isn't there and if people aren't showing up for their downtown. Yeah, I, I'll often uh, um, pump my wife Carrie's tires on her Instagram. Check out uh, Instagram, uh, follow Carrie Skelton. There's, there's a, a reel that she has up right now. Um, this is just, I just want to mention this for our friends, Jeff and Amy, that have owned and operated Sugared and Spiced, which is a fabulous uh, bakery on the south side just off white avenue in edmonton <clears throat> now the thing that sucks about this is that uh, jeff and amy have basically been putting out sos's you know on their social media for the past while like talking about their survival how precarious it is as a business and, and kind of hanging in the balance um but you know what happened um and i'm not putting this right on carrie i mean i think that this is you know there's a lot of factors at play but i, I told carrie that i had noticed that jeff and amy were kind of sounding the alarm you know we ordered a cookie platter for our family for Christmas. Carrie decided to go in and shoot a little video. The video has been viewed 60,000 times and they had to cut off their online orders yesterday because they need to be able to fill them all. I mean, they just got flooded. They got swamped with, with orders, uh, which is great. It's great in the short term. Like hopefully they'll be able to pay their bills this month. We'd like to see longer term sustainability. That's just one example though, Panita, of what you're talking about. Everybody loves sugar and spice. So when you find out that they might have to close their doors, and by the way, they've not said that, let me be clear, but I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just reading the tea leaves in front of me. Um, but then all of a sudden they get so much business that they can barely keep up with it. It's almost like we need to be reminded. I don't know. Yeah. It's such a tragedy that it takes that to get people to, you know, get up get out of their houses and well, go support these businesses, right? Even yeah. during COVID, like probably the six months in in 2020, we had about 75% of Canadians were going out of their way to shop local, which is a massive number because everyone was like, oh, first of all, it was out of necessity. They had to, um, but it was, there was the right emphasis on it. And now that number has dropped back down to about 27% of Canadians are going out of their way to shop local. So again, is that we have to constantly keep reminding people that, hey, like, convenience isn't necessarily the, the best way forward. 
Yeah. Um, I saw I saw an interesting comment here. On, uh, there's been a ton. I mean, the live chat's been booming this morning. You guys were not ignoring you, um, but uh, but uh, I have been reading them. And there, there was one from Nick here, uh, which is a fair comment. Nick says, going back to the office increases my expenses without increasing my income. There's no reason for me to choose that when my space at home is more comfortable. <laughs> and Nick's not wrong. Like for a lot of people at home, it's like, yeah, I'm at work for sure, but they're like on their phone in the hot tub, and like you can't beat that, <laughs> you know. So well, the, there's also the the view that that um, uh, there needs to be more than just the tasks at hand, and so companies feel the responsibility to be part of the the, the the community experience, making a positive contribution to the neighborhoods, and so beyond the task work, which you can do from from your computer anywhere. Uh, you, you have to ask, you know, what do we want our organization to stand for? Do we want our employees to make a positive contribution beyond the work for the company? You know, you, Panita talks about something interesting, which is the nostalgia argument. And downtown cores used to be defined by central business districts. So central business districts used to be really about the corporate prominence of their downtown cores. I believe that we've now shifted into downtowns being defined by a central social district. So the most successful, most vibrant downtown cores will have a successful social strategy. So if we really stop thinking about what makes our downtowns great, it, it's not about the corporate prominence anymore. Mm -hmm. They are central social districts. So when when you are working with like your your job, you're you're, you're sort of a matchmaker, right, Corey? Like mm -hmm. you're you're working with these you know these these uh, collectives or in some cases individuals that own these big beautiful properties downtown, and then also people that are looking for a great lease situation because they've got a big bold plan for their vision. So how have uh, you know in, in talking to to restaurateurs as an example, I was with one just yesterday. I said to him, what would it have to look like? And I said, I'm going to quote you on this. He said, don't name me. I said, okay, I'm going to quote you on it. I said, what would it have to look like for you to take a new space right now? He had a few questions. We settled on 4,000 square feet. He said, I'd be, I'd be prepared to open something at 4,000 square feet. He said, I would need 100,000 in TIs. I would need one year of rent for free. And I would need to be paying about 20 bucks a square foot. He goes, I know that's aggressive, but in my world, that's what I would need. Now, that would be quite a departure, wouldn't it, from, from, from when stuff was booming and vacancies were far and few between? Yeah, traditionally, you used to be able to get more revenue from ground level. And if you had um, office space above ground level that was more affordable, uh, you would be able to, if you were, if you were um, more successful upstairs, you would be able to get more success at ground level. Now it's the other way around. Property owners now need to look at their ground level spaces as loss leaders. If you want to be more successful upstairs, get your ground floor right. Get your ground floor to be occupied with vibrant, um, active businesses that, that thrive, and you'll get more people wanting to be back in those properties and working upstairs. So more space can be leased in the towers when you successfully lease your ground floor, not the other way around. Right. Um, well, well, this kind of sets the table for what we'll wrap with today. And, and, and I'd love to get from the three of you some prognostication, uh, you know, maybe what you think is going to happen in 2024. Heather, maybe like a, a trend that will play itself out or or maybe something that you're optimistic about, Corey, or, or Punita, something that you already have in the works that's coming up for 2024 that you think would be would be really cool. Uh, Corey, why don't you go first? 2024, looking ahead uh, in the context of what we're talking about, what are you keeping an eye on? The best properties in the most vibrant locations will continue to see success. We are going to see an ejection of more people moving downtown. There will be more younger people choosing to live downtown. That will then create more opportunities for retail and, and, and hospitality businesses to take that risk. And the risk is not just on the business owner, but also on the property owners. Together, there needs to be that marriage of, of, of risk taking that, that property owners need to be able to um, be more accommodating to get the right businesses in to occupy their ground level spaces. And those business owners are going to start taking more opportunities to lease space because you have this increasing downtown population. So that's what I'm excited about as we continue to see growth in education, which is our greatest opportunity. That is going to open up the opportunities for, for more properties to get leased, more residential towers to get built, and that's going to increase the downtown population. Panita, 2024 will be the year of? New retail storefronts uh, opening downtown. Uh, we have our retail attraction program, which uh, a lot of people in Edmonton might have heard of, but for those that aren't familiar, um, we were able to get some government funding to do 
really significant grants to six new retailers. We're this was that quarter million dollar next. grant, right? Yes. Yeah. For um, for six retailers. And, and it's a mix of cash and then also uh, business support. Um, and so we've got the three that are already announced, which is Good Goods, uh, fantastic place to do your Christmas shopping. Um, Growlery, which is, uh, oh, they have a brewery up by Blatchford. They're opening a new tap room downtown. Um, and the third one is Consign Design. They're opening like a home goods, homewares, decor, and cake shop all in one. So that's, I think there's also going to be a trend of more of that, more of like a, a three in one or five in one type of business. So there's Lockstock Coffee downtown, which is one of my favorite examples. Uh, a pub at night has been a pub for 20 years. They had this really tiny little spot that was underutilized. They blew it out, turned it into a cafe. Now it's an all day and all night business, um, kind of a two in one. And so I think we're going to see a lot more of that creative use of space, um, fitting multiple concepts into one space, just like the Henry Singer example we also talked about. Um, can I can I be a can I can I like piss you off for a quick second? Because this yeah. is this this is like the this is this is the yeah but what about answer to that? Is it true? That I, that I heard that those you've got six grants available for a quarter million dollars a piece, and I heard that like the applications weren't even full the first time around. Like they had to do a second call for applications. No, no, that's not what happened. What so happened? I'd love because I was shocked around. at that. Yeah, yeah. Hang on one minute, buddy. He is amazing. <laughs> I'm running out of time here. Yeah, no, you're the best. Um, Thanks for was, doing this. We were totally full and had six retailers um, <laughs> chosen. But as difficult as business circumstances are right now and, in, you know, inflation and tough business decisions being made, we actually had three of our original six that had to, to back out. Ah, so that okay. at that point, at that point, we opened it back up. But what was brilliant about that is we actually had an even bigger set of applicants the second time and like mind blowing the caliber the second time around. I almost feel like awareness wasn't high enough when we opened it up the first time. So we've got three new ones that are gonna be announced soon and I'm uh, even more excited about this last batch of applicants that we had. It's been uh, really incredible to see the businesses that are really well established businesses from elsewhere in the city that people will be familiar with that are really excited to come downtown. So that is something that uh, I'm really excited about. And then big, big events is the other thing that we're going to see a lot of in mm. 2024. All of our major festivals are back in full scale. We've scaled up two of our major events. Um, and so getting you know thousands of people downtown into our public spaces year round, um, starting from the spring all the way through to the holiday season uh, is going to be, and that is the marker of, of a lot of successful downtowns everywhere. Tourism. And like Corey said, the central social districts where people just want to come and gather and be together as community. Panita, you've been killing it as, uh, as first executive director, now CEO of the Edmonton downtown business association. People can check out edmontondowntown.com for more. Harrison has been an absolute gem on his best behavior this morning. And we're all so proud of him. Please let him know. Thank you for continuing to join us, Panita, and give us this voice. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Just you got to clean it. his nose here. You right got there. it. She's like executive of the year, mom of the year at the same time. I love that. That's Punita McBrien. Um, 2024, Heather, mm. what's uh, maybe a trend or, or something you're going to be keeping an eye on? Something I'm excited to see from a consumer perspective is how AI is really going to uh, start to take, I think, a lot of uh, space in the world of retail. Um, I think there's a lot of really cool things that are coming onto market and just like even as simple as like the checkout experience at a grocery store. Like I'm excited for that to go away forever. Um, I'm not saying that's going to necessarily happen in 2024, but things like that, different tools are going to be coming readily available, more affordable that are going to make the consumer's lives a lot easier. So I'm excited to see how we're going to be adopting technology um, throughout the next, throughout the next, well, really the next two years as we scale up and this becomes more affordable. So I'm, I can't wait to see that. Mm. Kathy on our chat says, uh, she's in the office five days a week cause she prefers it says, but it's nice to have the option to work from home if necessary. A lot of our staff choose that option. She says, so it's been a good recruitment option. Yeah. I never really thought of it in the context of recruitment. A lot of job seekers will be saying, I mean, if they're in a position, mm -hmm. uh, to be selective would be saying, well, yeah, what is your policy on, on work from home? Are you, are you like a need to be in the office guy? I prefer it. So I, I actually also really enjoy asking this question to people that we are interviewing and I ask, how do you feel about working in the office? And I have discovered, and, and, you know, Heather and I know we, you know, we, we've spoken to a lot of students together and, and, 
young people come from a highly social learning environment and they want to work in a highly social work environment. They want to be around their peers and senior people and learn through osmosis and be in the eye of senior management. Young people want to be in the office. It's actually people mm -hmm. who are more experienced. If we look at the trends in, in most professional services organizations, the senior people are the ones who feel a bit more entitled that they have earned it through their career to be able to have more freedom of where they choose. The young generation are more attentive. They want to be in the office and they see that opportunity for growth faster and to be elevated and promoted sooner when they are in the eye of their senior people. You and I talked mm -hmm. about uh, sort of job seekers and millennial trends and things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, Gen Z trends, not even millennials. Yeah. Um, Man, that's how old I am. I As I look at like the young people's millennials, they're not the young ones anymore. I millennials know. are like the execs now, and we're yeah. Well, because Gen anyway. Z is ninety-seven, is eighty. Yeah, it starts at ninety-seven to two thousand ten. Yeah. So there's a lot of Gen Zs coming up in the workforce, and it's interesting because we do, we do a lot of data at the university around finding out what do Gen Zs want in their workforce, and and when they choose to leave uh, school, where are they going? And a lot of it's actually it's, sometimes it's a mixed bag. Some of them are like, I I need to learn. They have that self-awareness that they need to be in the office because they need to just physically see what's happening and be around other people. Whereas in some um, younger Gen Z who have done the majority of their school online feel really equipped and happy to continue to work in a remote capacity. And that's something we need to be aware of because I do think as, we, as people who are a little bit more established in their career, you think about your key lessons that you've learned, they were in person. So it's definitely something yeah. that we should be aware of. But it's actually Gen X is the generation that wants to work remotely. That wants to work remotely, yeah. Gen X. Yeah, the majority of Gen X. Yeah. It, what, is, what is it like? I'm oversimplifying. Is it like being able to pick your kids up from school? Like, is that kind of the... It's everything. I also think because they're more established, they can see that they, oh, I know how to do my job and I can do it effectively and I can do it in a condensed way. I don't right. have the steep learning curve that the younger people have and you don't have, and they appreciate the flexibility and there, there's so many demands, you know, on their time, people ages 30 to 45 that they really enjoy the idea of being able to work remotely or where it suits them, I should say. Johnny, you and I see the benefit of, of being in person all the time. Like when it comes to stepping outside of our, our norm and getting creative and working on projects, hey, wouldn't you say? Sure. <laughs> it's like we got we should so bring many in, mics we should, today. We there we go. In, we should pipe in. So I like that Christmas music. That was nice. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, uh, we're kind of in the space where we've taken ourselves out of that. But at the same time, like we need to go see people like today. It's nice to see people yeah. in the studio like this. And obviously, when we're talking to our advertisers and people like that, we need to go talk to them face yeah. to face. But I will say that I, I don't know about the self checkout thing <laughs> that Heather's <laughs> talking about. I, I, I think it's going to go away more in the future. Go but, away? Yeah. But uh, at the same time, it kind of hurts me a bit because, you know, it is jobs being lost. But second of all, I hate ringing in those vegetables. You know how you got to like go in so, and type in the vegetable no, Johnny, and then Johnny, you got to weigh it. <laughs> if I have a lot of veggies, I'm going to the, the person. If I have a bunch of stuff with barcodes, I'll, I'll go to the self. So Johnny, what about yeah. just no checkout? No checkout? I'm, se I'm not self checkouts yeah, I've are seen at Walmart. These too. They're yeah. actually removing yeah. quite a bit of them so, because it's such old how, technology. How, how does no checkout work? So, so you just leave. So, and what the, the the lasers pick up on the that's right so you're using your phone or their smart I cards sound yeah. they've got old. a lot oh, some sort of laser <laughs> <You're> <laughs> they've like, got wow. they've got three of them in New York now pretty much like bodegas you know how they have little small markets everywhere where you can get you can get everything you can get cigarettes you can get pop you can get bread everything but it, basically well, you just, cigarettes you is just your ping. number one thing <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean like a bodega is like a, a one stop shop like a Seven Eleven but in New York they have three of them now where you can just tap your credit card as you go in. Yeah. Literally, you can go yeah. with a group of people, actually, like a family of four. You can go get whatever you want, walk out, and as you walk out, it just dings you. They have them here. We have them in Edmonton. Yeah. We have a few in Edmonton, and there's, like, massive grocery stores. And, wow. Um, and it's also, like, yeah, that, and then uh, Sobeys, I believe, they have a smart cart. So you can actually, like, just put your stuff in the cart, and you just go. So yeah. when I, I, I want to be really clear when people are like, I hate self-checkout. I'm saying, I'm saying no checkout. Like, yeah. Just that's the future. Actually, every time you're lining up to check out, I want you to be annoyed because the technology exists that you don't have to do that anymore. Sure. Yeah. But it's also like, I think people are trying to save nowadays. So sometimes I'll even do it. I'll go get a bunch of stuff. 
I'll go to the self checkout. I'll ring it a bunch of stuff, but I'll put like the expensive. I don't really need this if I don't have enough money stuff at the end. Yeah. And then if the the, the total gets over like two hundred, I'm like, all right, I don't need the Oreos. I don't need <laughs> these things, right? So I, I think there's still a place for it now, but I do agree. I think it's going to go away. And AI, we were just talking about this, Ryan. How AI. I think personally from my business alone, DJing, I think in the next three to five years, like 50% of my business is going to go away. Because I feel like people at events, weddings, stuff like that, they already are saying, should I get a DJ or should I just play a playlist? Whoa. And once the playlist thinks for itself <laughs> and you can put in a genre and it just goes, I, th I think. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I saw a comment from Akhet in our live chat that said, uh, oh, yes, how ex they're taking a swipe at you, Heather. Perfect. Uh, they said, oh, yes, how ex <laughs> how exciting people's jobs replaced by robots. They're not. Being can, can I say one sentence yeah. I saw somebody say is that AI, uh, your job is not going to be taken by AI. Yes. Your job is going to be taken by somebody who, who understands how to use AI That's to do right. your job. That's right. And actually, even in the Amazon Go stores, it, the data shows that there's way higher labor costs associated. They're just in different places. So you're not, yeah, they're not doing the scanning and the checkout. They're mm -hmm. helping customers in the store. They're doing other things. And so that's, I want to make sure that everyone hears me really loud and clear is that when, when businesses make digital shifts or something like that for the for the benefit of saving money the business is going to lose yeah when you make these transitions to help the consumer and have the consumer have a better time then you're you're actually adding more jobs to it and i agree it's like it, the late 90s when everyone's like computers are going to take totally. our jobs but now all we do is we service the computers and yeah. that's what will happen with ai you'll have to you'll have to learn how to use it how to service it how to create it how to upkeep it and that's what we'll do in the future we'll just be AI specialists, right? I, uh, yeah, by the way, I wanted to note plain power. I saw in the live chat said, pick your kids up from school. Whatever happened to kids walking home from school? Well, number one, not everybody lives that close. Um, and number two, there's something very special. If I can make it and I work for myself, so I, I prioritize it at least once a week. We balance it out as a family to be there when my kid is still young enough to come out the door of the school and see me and be excited and yell daddy and run over and give me a hug. Mm -hmm. Are you kidding me? I mean, pretty soon, if I show up at his high school, he's going to be like, That doesn't oh, happen? Get, get out of here. What are you doing here? Get out of here. So I, I take advantage of it. Those little moments in time, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's know. not as though you've stopped working when you've gone to pick up your son. It, you end up working later in the evening when your son goes to sleep. Totally. You're often thinking about work and, and checking in. And so, you know, we've actually extended the hours yeah. in the week that we work. We just aren't doing them all concentrated in the office at the same time. Yeah, very well said. Um, I appreciate all the comments here in the live chat as well. A lot of you sort of been talking to us about what your work workplace has been doing or, 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 you know, what sort of a working scenario you prefer from home. Or I saw a lot of people talking about a hybrid scenario. A lot of you just need to be in the office. For me, that's kind of more my style. I need to, if I'm, if I'm at home, uh, it just, it, it just kind of doesn't work. We're, and this is why Johnny, I, I, you know, the DJ business better than I do. We need but, a blend, but I'm all about people. Mm -hmm. And we built this space this way because we want people to gather. And mm -hmm. I think like if I'm throwing a party where the vibe, I mean, I like to be the, the, the president of vibe management at all parties that I'm putting on. <laughs> on a Tuesday. Uh, on a t <laughs> as soon as we wrap. Um, I would say that like a personality like yours, mm. uh, Johnny Infamous, uh, you know, <laughs> or developed over years. But when you walk in a room, there's an energy. Yeah. And when when our DJ of choice, she DJs our parties like DJ Navasia. She she is yeah. an she is a personality mm -hmm. in the room mm -hmm. and just hitting a Spotify playlist. I mean, that's great at yeah. home. I'm probably not going to hire a DJ for a New Year's party in my house. No, maybe. Uh, but I'll never go <laughs> playlist for the Real Talk Christmas but, party. But not I, a chance. I think it's the crunch, right? People will say, do I pay this guy? And I won't say my price but it could be thousands of dollars <laughs> thousand let's say let's say two thousand dollars or i'm gonna use this ai program which is 250 dollars for the night right but i will say that i think working we're turning into this blend now right where like i agree like you have to have meetings in person you have to have office spaces you have to have leadership where people have this energy and all that happens in person but at the same time you could stay home three days a week and zoom into work or do whatever you need to do in a meeting and That'll work as well. So I think the future is going to be a blend. But I like, uh, who's this? Uh, somebody said automation 
is going to be the key to the future. And I, I agree with that 100%. And if you're not on board with it, like everything's going to be automated. What we're talking about with Heather here, what we're talking about with the music, AI is going to kind of automate our lives. And if you don't jump on, it's going to just be like the late 90s with computers. But we're computers. all, we're all, we're get all left pretending or, or acting like, like that's new. Like it's not new. Te Automation has, isn't. But. Yeah, but technology has always disrupted yeah. industry. Yeah. And employment, and there's always been factors at play, right? And then we always have jobs afterwards. Like, that's the crazy thing here. I That's why I wanted to bring it up as a good news thing, because as consumers, we're going to win. As, as humans, we're going to win, because things are just going to be better. Like, the robots are not coming for us. Like, that's not what's happening. <laughs> we're just going to have a better quality of, of life in many different ways. Yeah. Um, oh, the interesting comment here from MA who says we don't have personal contact as much, you know, so the future mm -hmm. looks bleak to me if we don't have cashiers or other people to speak with when we're shopping. That's interesting. But we will. And I want to, that's something that's really critical, but we will. So the, right now in our society and as we think about us as consumers, we actually interact at the checkout. But that's not what's going to happen anymore. You're going to interact with other people throughout your entire experience. You actually spend the same amount of time in the physical store when you're shopping. You actually just interact with people throughout the store. So it just it's not that we will be more isolated. We're going to have opportunities for connection. They're just not going to look like the same points of connection that we've had are, are from what we've known up to, up I don't to know. this point. I hate people at the grocery store. I know. Store. <laughs> Some people like, are I love, ecstatic. I love people in person and I love meeting with clients. And you're right. I got that energy when I'm working. But on the Sunday, like, do not talk do to me not at the grocery store Johnny. in my pajama pants. If Johnny is wearing his sunglasses inside, <laughs> do not talk to him. Um, Chad is not wrong in our live chat. Says the steam engine did steal all the horses' jobs. Chad is correct on that. Uh, why won't people think of the horses? Um, my thanks to Panita McBrien, who uh, was with us, of course, remotely. Uh, Heather Thompson of, of the U of A. Can I, can I break the news? At least half of the half news. Half of the news. For yeah. two more days, <laughs> Heather Thompson will serve as the executive director at the U of A School of Business Center for Cities and Communities. I can't wait to hear what you're doing next. Congratulations. Thank it's you. been a hell of a run for you there, Heather. You've yes. put it, uh, I mean, just done an amazing job, not just developing the business leaders of today and tomorrow, but also people, uh, regulars here on Real Talk have heard about the digital economy program and we'll be mentioning mm -hmm. it again next week. Um, and that's all been under your tutelage and your initiative. So uh, congratulations on the great you. run at the U of A. Thank you very much. You Panita's bet. still here if you want to say goodbye. Panita's still hanging out? Yeah, she's oh, of course. Oh, hi. Still hanging out. Oh, <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't mean to write you off or leave you hanging there. Thank you so much for joining no, us, Panita. So and, and a very happy holidays to you and your family. Yeah, you too. Thanks for having me. I love these conversations. Yeah, you bet. And Corey Wozniak, who's uh, um, obviously, if, if, if you know commercial real estate in the province of Alberta, you know uh, Corey's name. Uh, he's right there at the top of everybody's list as uh, managing director at Avis and Young and uh, a, a good friend and, a, and an ardent supporter of a ton of charities in Edmonton. So I look forward to the next time our paths cross, pal, wishing you and your family a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for everything you do, Ryan, oh. really. Well, you know what? Uh, we do it. Uh, for you know, because we have uh, partners and supporters and friends of the show like you three, we do it because we have, uh, in my mind, Canada's best and most engaged talk audience. Uh, the live chat's been booming today, and we know that when this podcast drops, we're going to be hearing uh, from a bunch more of you. And of course, our sponsors and our partners as well. I want to update you on a story we covered yesterday and tee up tomorrow's show. Today was about t trend watching and, and, and business and commerce and employment. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to get back to the news cycle. But first, I want to remind you that California Closets their team is ready to hit the ground running in January. Why? Because some of the smartest gift givers this holiday season have been paying attention to what their life partner, to what their spouse, their soulmate has been saying, sometimes indirectly, non-verbally, piling up laundry on the floor, shoes on top of one another in the broom closet. Haven't been able to find anything in the storage room because the storage room is a disaster. Sounds like it's time for the perfect Christmas gift that is a free consultation with California Closets, and then, of course, a transformative addition to your living space. Whether it's in the home, whether it's in the home office, whether it's in the garage, California Closets has a custom closet or storage solution for you. Make the most of your space with their custom organizational systems. You can start that process by visiting them online at californiaclosets.ca. Maybe your home investment is going to be outside. Maybe you have an outdoor space that needs to be brought to life. 
What a perfect time of year to visit landscapeedmonton.ca. That's Eden Landscaping. More than 20 years of experience as a custom landscape builder with on-the-ground experience in Edmonton and surrounding area. Whether you're looking for an ultra-modern design, whether you want to tap into your home's heritage vibe, whether you're looking for stunning stonework or an outdoor kitchen, a water feature, or heck, you just need your retaining wall repaired or replaced, they do it all at Eden Landscaping. Full project management, which means you don't have to deal with subcontractors or delays. You don't have to keep an eye on everything as it's happening. That's what Mike and his team do. We personally recommend Eden Landscaping at landscapeedmonton.ca. And for those of you that are job seeking right now, or maybe just putting in your time at a job you quite frankly can't stand anymore. If you're an electrician or if you're an uh, apprentice electrician, if you're looking for a new opportunity, maybe you're an expert as a technologist or heck, a professional engineer. Are you an administrative professional? Are you a sales professional? Kubi Renewable Energy is expanding their team in Calgary, Edmonton, Kamloops, and Lethbridge right now. You can learn more by visiting the careers link at kubienergy.ca. Join their team as they grow clean energy in Canada. Kubi Energy is hiring right now again at kubienergy.ca. We put an unofficial, unscientific Twitter poll out yesterday, and as we wrap the show, I just wanted to check in on it to let you know as we talked to Charles Adler about the fate of Jaskarat Singh Sidhu. He's the trucker that caused the crash that claimed 16 lives, injured 13 more people on board that Humboldt Broncos team bus. Well, it looks like he's going to be deported from Canada. And we asked you if you think that's the right move. If you missed Charles Adler's answer yesterday, I encourage you to check it out. It was not what I expected, and he didn't think twice before making his statement. The audience, at least the people that follow me on Twitter, see it quite differently. We've reached the final results of our Twitter poll with 2,936 votes. 84% of people think that Jaskrat Singh Sidhu should be allowed on compassionate grounds to stay in Canada. 15.5% figure he should be deported. But Charles' interview with me also prompted a bunch of feedback, including some pretty powerful emails. We're going to get to those tomorrow. I also spoke with David Knight Legg yesterday, member former principal advisor to Premier Jason Kenney, about the future of oil and gas, natural gas in particular, and why he figures that Canada laid a big egg at COP28. Well, we heard from some energy commentators, including Markham Hislop, who's the publisher of Energy Media. He's going to join me off the top on Wednesday's Real Talk. We'll call it a fact check, a different perspective, if you like. That's our goal. It's the whole bedrock upon which this show is built. Differing, credible perspectives, and of course, a forum where we can hash it all out. Determine our own opinions on matters based on the facts, on the truth. And then, of course, ensuring that we always keep that talk real. Thanks for being a big part of that. We'll see you soon. Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson. Executive producer, Josh Dunford. Technical producer, John Hicks. 